Hello everyone, welcome to this CUBE Conversation. I'm John Furrier, host of the CUBE here in our Palo Alto studios. We're featuring OctoML. I'm host, I'm, I'm with the CEO, Luis Says, Chief Executive Officer, co-founder of OctoML. I'm John Furrier of the CUBE. Thanks for joining us today. Luis, great to see you. Last time we spoke was at Remars, Amazon's event, kind of a joint event between Adidas and, and Amazon, kind of put a lot together. Um, great to see you. Great to see you again, John. I really have good memories of that interview. You know, that was uh, definitely a great time. Great to chat with you again. The world of ML and AI, machine learning and AI is really hot. Everyone's talking about it. It's really great to see that advance. So I want, I'm looking forward to this conversation, but before we get started, introduce who you are in OctoML. Sure, I'm uh, Louis Sazi, co-founder and CEO at OctoML. I'm also a professor of computer science at the University of Washington. Um, you know, um, OctoML grew out of our effort on the Apache TVM project, which is a compiler and runtime system that enables folks to run machine learning models on a broad set of hardware in the edge and in the cloud very efficiently. You know, we grew that project and, uh, and, and grew that community. Definitely saw it was solving a pain point there. And then we built OctoML. OctoML is about three and a half years old now. And the mission of the company is to um, enable uh, customers to deploy models very efficiently um, in the cloud and uh, make them, you know, run, do it quickly, run fast and run at a low cost, which is something that's especially timely right now. Right? I like to point out also for the folks, because uh, they should know that you're also a professor in the computer science department at the University of Washington, a great program there. This is a really an, an inflection point with AI and machine learning. The computer mm -hmm. science industry has been waiting for decades to advance AI with all this new cloud computing, all the hardware and silicon advancements, GPUs. This is the perfect right. storm. And you know, you, this, the computer science now, we, we're seeing an acceleration. Can you share your your view? You're in you're you're obviously a professor in that department, but also an entrepreneur. This is a great time for computer science. Uh, explain why. Oh, well, absolutely, yeah. No, just like just the confluence of you know advances in what you know computers can do as devices to compute information, plus you know advances in AI that enable applications that you know we thought was highly futuristic, and now it's just right there today. You know, uh, you know AI that can generate photorealistic images from descriptions. You know, um, can write text. That's that that's pretty good. Can help augment you know um, human uh, creativity in a really meaningful way. So seeing the confluence of capabilities and the creativity of humankind into new applications is just extremely exciting, both from a researcher point of view, as well as, as an entrepreneur point of view, right? What should people know about these large language models we're seeing with ChatGPT? I know Google has got a lot of work going on in that area. There's been a lot of work recently. What's different now about these, these models and why are they so popular and effective now? What's the difference between now and say five years ago that makes it makes it- Oh yeah. It's a huge, huge, huge inflection on their capabilities. I would say like emergent behavior, right? So as these models got more complex and our ability to train and deploy them, you know, uh, got, got to, to, to this point, you know, they really cross the threshold into doing things that are truly surprising, right? In terms of generating, you know, acceleration for things, generating tax, summarizing tax, expanding tax, um, and it, you know, exhibiting what to some may look like reasoning. They're not quite reasoning fundamentally. They're generating tax that looks like they're reasoning, but they do it so well that it feels like it was done by uh, by a human, right? So I'd say that the, the, the biggest change is that, you know, now they can actually do things that are extremely useful for uh, business and people's lives today. That And that wasn't the case uh, five years ago. So that's in the model capabilities. And that is being paired with huge advances in, in computing that enable this to be, enables this to be, you know, actually see line of sites to be deployed at scale, right? And that's where we come in, by the way, but yeah. Yeah, I want to get into that. And also, you know, the, the, the fusion of data, integrating data sets uh, at scale is another one we're seeing a lot of um, happening now. It's not just some, you know, siloed, pre-built data modeling. It's a lot of agility and a lot of uh, new integration capabilities of data. How is that impacting the, the dynamics? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say that uh, the ability to uh, either take the data that had, that exists and training a model to do something useful with it, and more interestingly, I would say using baseline foundational models and with a little bit of data, turn them into something that can do a specialized task really, really well, created this really fast proliferation of, of really impactful um, applications, right? If, if, every, if every company now is looking at this trend, and I'm seeing a lot, and I, I think every company will, 
rebuild their, their business with machine learning um, if they're not already doing it. And the folks that aren't will mm -hmm. probably be dinosaurs, they'll be out of business. This is a, a, a real business transformation moment where machine learning and AI, as it goes mainstream, I think it's just the beginning. This is where you guys come in and you guys are poised for handling this frenzy to uh, change business with machine learning mod models. Um, how do you guys help customers as they look yeah. at this you know, <laughs> transition to get you know, concept to production with machine learning? Great, great questions. Yeah, so I would say that it's fair, it's fair to say there's a bunch of models out there uh, that can do useful things right off, the, right off the box, right? So, and also the ability to create models improved quite a bit. So the challenge now shifted to customers, you know, everyone is looking to incorporating AI into their applications. So what, what we do for them is to, first of all, how do you do that? quickly without needing highly specialized, difficult to find engineering. And very importantly, how do you do that at a cost that's accessible, right? So um, all of these fantastic models that we just talked about, they take they use an amount of computing that's just ast astronomical compared to anything else we've done in the past. It means that the costs that come with it are also very, very high. So uh, it's important to uh, enable customers to, um, you know, incorporate AI into their applications, to their use cases in a way that they can do with the people that they have and at the cost that they can afford such that it can have, you know, the maximum impact you possibly have. And finally, you know, helping them deal with hardware availability. As uh, as you know, you know, even though we made a lot of progress in, in making computing cheaper and cheaper, even to this day, you know, you can never get enough. And getting an allocation, getting the right hardware to run uh, these uh, incredibly hungry models is, is hard. And we help customers deal with, you know, hardware availability as well. Yeah, for the folks watching, there's a, if you search YouTube, um, there's an interview we did last year at Remars. I mentioned that earlier, just a great interview. You talked about this hardware independence uh, extraction. I want to get into that because if you look at all the, the um, foundation models that are out there right now that are getting traction, you're seeing two trends. Mm -hmm. You're seeing proprietary and open source. Uh, and, and, and obviously open source always wins in my opinion, but you know, there's this mm -hmm. iPhone moment and Android moment that uh, uh, one of your investors, John True um, from Madrona talked about was, is iPhone versus Android moment. You know, one's proprietary mm -hmm. hardware uh, and they're um, very specialized, high performance, and then open source. Um, mm -hmm. This is an important distinction and you guys are hardware independent. Um, what's, uh, what, mm -hmm. explain, explain what all this means. Yeah, great. Though, uh, great, great set of questions. Uh, first of all, yeah. So, um, you know, OpenAI, you know, of course, they they created ChatGPT and and they offer an API to to run these models that uh, does amazing things. But customers have to be able to go and send their data over to OpenAI, right? So and run the model there and get the outputs. Now, there's open source models that can do amazing things as well, right? So they typically open source models today don't lag behind, you know, these proprietary closed models by more than say, you know, six months or so. So let's say, um, and that means that enabling customers to take the models that they want and deploy under their control is something that's very valuable because one, you you don't you don't have to expose your data to um, externally. Two, you can customize the model even more to the things that you wanted to do. And then three, you can run on an infrastructure that can be much more cost effective than having to uh, you know pay somebody else's you know uh, cost and markup, right? So, and where we help them is essentially help customers uh, enable customers to take machine learning models say an open source model and automate the process of uh, putting them into production, optimize them to run with the right performance, and more importantly, give them the independence to run where they need to run, where they can run best, right? So. Yeah, and also, you know, I, I, I point out all the time that, you know, there's never, never any stopping the innovation of hardware, silicon, uh, you're seeing cloud computing more more coming in there. So you know, being hardware independent has some advantages. Um, and if you look at OpenAI, for instance, you mentioned ChatGPT, I think this is interesting because I think everyone is scratching their head going, okay, I need to move to this new generation. What's, what's, yeah. your, what's your pro tip and advice for folks who want to move to, or businesses that want to say, move to machine learning? How do they get started? What are some of the considerations mm -hmm. they need to think about to deploy these models into production? 
Yeah, great. Oh, um, great set of questions. First of all, I mean, they, I'm sure they're very aware of the kind of things that you want to do with, with AI, right? So it could be interacting with customers, uh, you know, automating interacting with customers. It could be, you know, uh, finding issues in production lines. It could be, you know, uh, generating, you know, making it easier to produce content and so on. Like, you know, customers, uh, users would have an idea what they want to do. You know, from that, you can actually determine what kind of machine learning models, uh, would, would, would solve the problem that, uh, would, you know, fit that, that use case. But then that's that's when the hard thing uh, begins, right? So when you find a model, identify the model that can do the thing that that you want to do, you need to turn that into uh, a thing that you can deploy. So how do you go from machine learning model that does the thing that you need to do to a container with the right executables, the right thing, the artifact that you can actually go um, and deploy, yeah. right? So we've seen customers uh, doing that on their own, Right. So, and it's, it's quite a bit of work. And that's why uh, we're excited about the automation that we can offer and then turn that into a, 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 a turnkey problem. Right. So a, a turnkey process. Well, let's talk about the uh, use cases. And if I, if I, if I don't mind going to double down on mm -hmm. the previous answer, you got existing services and then there's new AI applications, AI for mm -hmm. applications. Um, how do you, what are the use cases with existing stuff and the new applications that are being built? Yeah, I mean, um, existing stuff is, for example, how do you do very smart search and auto completion? You know, when you are editing uh, documents, for example, very very smart search of documents, summarization of of text, expanding bullets into into prose in a way that you know don't have to spend as much human time. Those are some of, some of the existing applications, right? So uh, some of the new ones are like truly AI native ways of producing content. Like there's a company that um, you know we uh, we are we share investors and a lot of what they're doing called one way ML, for example, it's sort of like an AI first way of editing and creating visual content. And so you could say you have a video, you could say make this video look like it's night as opposed to dark or remove that dog in the corner. You can do that in a way that you couldn't do otherwise. So there's like definitely AI native um, um, use cases. And yet another one in life sciences, you know, there's quite a bit of advances on AI based, uh, you know, therapies and diagnostics processes that are designed uh, using automated processes. And this is something that I feel like we're just scratching the surface there, there's huge opportunities there, right? Talk about the um, inference and AI in production kind of angle here, because yeah. cost is a huge concern mm -hmm. um, when you look at, and you mentioned hardware and, and that flexibility there, so I can see how that could help, but is there a cost uh, uh, freight train that can get out of control here if you don't deploy properly? Oh, Talk about the scale absolutely. problem around costs and, and, and AI. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, very quickly, one thing that people tend to think about is the cost is, you know, training has really high dollar amounts. It tends to over index on that. But what you have to think about is that for every model that's actually useful, you're going to train it once and then run it a large number of times in inference. That means that over the lifetime of a model, the majority, the vast majority of the compute cycles and the costs are going to go to inference. And that's what we address, right? So, and to, to give you some idea, if you're talking about using a large language model today, you know, you can say it's going to cost a couple of cents uh, per, you know, 2,000 word output. If you have a million users active, you know, a day, you know, if you're lucky and you have that, you can, this, this cost can actually balloon very quickly to millions of dollars a month, just in inferencing costs, you know, assuming, uh, you know, that you actually have access to the infrastructure to run it, right? So it means that if you don't pay attention to these, um, to these inference cost and that's definitely going to be a, a surprise and affects the economics of the product where this is embedded in right so this is something that you know if there's quite a bit of attention being put on right now on how do you do search with large language models and if you don't pay attention to the economics you know uh you know you you, you can have a surprise i have to change the business model there yeah that, i think that's important to call out because you don't want it to be a runaway cost structure where you you architected it wrong and then next thing you know you got to unwind that I mean, it's more than technical debt. It's actually real debt. It's real money. So, right. so, so, talk about some of the right. dynamics with the customers. How are they? How are they architecting this? How do they get ahead of the that that problem? What do you guys do specifically to solve that? Yeah, I mean, what we what we help customers do is first of all be be hyper aware, you know, understanding what's going to be the cost for them deploying the models into production and and showing them the possibilities of how you can deploy the model with a different cost structure. Right. So that's where, you know, um, the ability to have hardware independence is so important because once you have hardware independence, 
after you optimize models, obviously, you have a new, uh, you know, dimension of freedom to choose, you know, what is the right throughput per dollar for you and then where uh, and what are the options. And once you make that decision, you want to automate the process of putting into production. So the way we help customers is showing very clearly in their use case, you know, how um, how they can deploy their models in a, in a much more cost effective way. You know, in one of the cases, there's a case study that we put out recently showing a 4x reduction in deployment costs. Right. So this is by doing a mix of optimization and, and choosing the right hardware. How do you uh, address the concern that someone might say, Luis, that, hey, you know, I don't want to degrade performance and latency and I don't want the user experience to suffer. Can you, what's, what's the answer there? Yeah. Uh Two things. So first of all, all of the manipulations that we do in the model is to turn the model into efficient code without changing the behavior of the model. So we do not, we wouldn't degrade the, the experience of the user by having the model be wrong more often. No, we don't change that at all. The model behaves the way it was uh, validated for. And then the second thing is, um, you know, user experience with respect to latency, it's all about a maximum. Like you could say, I want a model to run at 50 milliseconds or less. If it's much faster than 50 milliseconds, you're not going to notice the difference. But if it's lower, you're going to notice the difference. So the key here is that how do you find a set of options to deploy that you're not overshooting performance in a way that's going to lead to costs that has no additional benefits. And this has this provides a, huge, a very significant margin um, of, of choices, set of choices that uh, you can optimize for costs without degrading um, customer experience, right? And user experience. Yeah, and I also point out the large language models like the chat GPTs of the world that are coming out with uh, David yeah. Moth and I were talking on the on his breaking analysis around this being like over 10x more computational intensive on on, right. on capabilities. So this well, hardware well over 10x, yeah. is a huge thing. So uh, and also supply chain. I mean, some people can't get servers, by the way. So or, or hardware these days. So. Or even more interestingly, right? So they do not grow in trees, John. Like GPUs is not kind of stuff that you plant an orchard and all of a sudden you have a bunch and then yeah. you're going to increase it through, but no, these things, you know, take a while. So, and you can't re increase it overnight. So being able to live with the cycles that are available to you is not just important for all, for costs, but also important to people to scale and serve more users at, you know, uh, at whatever pace that they come, right? So. You know, it's really great to talk to you and congratulations on Auckland. We're looking forward to the startup showcase. We'll, we'll be featuring you guys there, but I want to get your personal opinion as uh, someone in the, the industry and also someone who's been in the computer science area for your career. You know, computer science has always been great and there's more people enrolling in computer science, mm -hmm. more diversity than ever before, but there's also more computer science related fields. How is mm -hmm. this opening up uh, computer science and where's AI going with the computers, with the science? Can you share your vision on, you know, the, the aperture or the, the landscape of CompSci or CS uh, uh, students yeah. and, and opportunities? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think it's fair to say that computing has been embedded in pretty much every aspect of human life these days, human life these days, right? So for everything, um, and uh, AI has been a counterpart, it's been an integral component of, of, of computer science for a while. And this renaissance that happened in the last 10, 15 years in, in AI has shown you know, new application that has, I think, re-energized how people see what computers um, what computers can do. And you know, uh, there is this picture in our department that shows computer science at the center called the flower picture, and then all the different paddles like life sciences, social sciences, and then you know, mechanical engineering, and all these other things. That, and I feel like you can replace that center with yeah, computer science. I put AI there as well. You see AI, you know, touching all these applications. AI in in healthcare, in diagnostics, AI in in by in in discovery in the sciences, right? So, uh, but then also AI doing things that you know uh, the humans wouldn't have to do anymore. They can do better things with their brains, right? So it's permeating every single aspect of uh, of human life, from intellectual endeavor to day to day work, right? Yeah, I think and I think the Chat GPT and Open AI has really kind of created a mainstream view that everyone sees value in it, like. You could be in the data center, you could be in bio, you could be in healthcare. I mean, every industry sees value. So this brings up what I yeah. call the horizontally scalable use cases. Um, and so this, this opens <laughs> up the conversation. What's going to change from this? Because if you go horizontally scalable, which is a cloud concept, as you know, that's going to create a lot of opportunities and some shifting of um, how you think about architecture around data, for instance. What's your uh, mm -hmm. opinion on what this will do to change the inflection of of the role of architect, architecting uh, platforms and the role of data specifically. 
Yeah, so um, good question. There's there is a lot in there, but I, mean, I I should have added the previous question that you can use AI to do better AI as well, which is what we do and other folks are doing as well. Uh, and um, so the point I wanted to make here is that it's pretty clear that you you, you have a uh, cloud focused component with a with an edge focused counterparts. Like you have AI models, but both in the cloud and in the edge, right? So the ability of being able to run uh, your AI model where it runs best also has a data advantage to it from a from a privacy point of view. That's inherent. You could say, hey, I want to run something. In, uh, uh, you know, locally, strictly locally, such that I don't expose the data to infrastructure and you know that the data never leaves you, right? Never leaves the device. Now you can imagine things that's already starting to happen, like you do some forms of training and model customization in the model architecture itself and the system architecture such that you do this as close to the user as possible. Um, and there's something called federated learning that has been around for some time now that's finally happening is how do you gather data from virtual places? You do, you know, some common learning and then you send a model to, to the edges and they get refined for the final for, for the final use in a way that you get the advantage of aggregating data, but you don't get the disadvantage of privacy issues and so on. It's so super exciting. That's area. Some, of the, some of the considerations, yeah. It's a super exciting area around data infrastructure, data science, computer science. Luis, congratulations on your success at OctaML. You're in the middle of it. And the best thing about it is businesses are looking at this and really uh, reinventing themselves. And if a business isn't thinking Absolutely. about restructuring their business around AI, they probably will be out of business. So this is a, a great time to be in the field. So thank you for sharing your insights here in theCUBE. Great, thank you very much, John. Always a pleasure talking to you. Always have a lot of fun. And we both speak really fast, I can tell, you know, so. <laughs> I know. We'll have the transcript available. We'll integrate it into our CUBE yeah. GPT model that we have. Um, Louis, that's, that, that's right. Great, 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 great to talk see to you. you. Thank you, John. Take great care. to see you, bye. Okay, this is theCUBE. I'm John Furrier here in Palo Alto. CUBE Conversation, thanks for watching.